As we kick off the 2022 Celtic FC AGM, I'm joined by Chairman Ian Bankier, Chief Executive Michael Nicholson and Chief Financial Officer Chris Mackay. Chairman, if I can come to you first, a lot has changed over the last year. What have been the highlights for you? So for me, it kicked off uh, with the appointment of Ange. Um, it was, uh, you have to remember, COVID was in full flow and it was very difficult to get him across from Japan, uh, for him to travel, for us to get him into the country. So it took time, but uh, it was literally uh, at the start of the financial year that we appointed Ange, and that was the start of stabilising the whole of the football department, and uh, that was needed. And then we rebuilt and built the team, and we went forward from there. Uh, and then we turned to the executive management, and we've stabilised that with the appointment of Michael, uh, as CEO and then the uh, appointment of uh, Chris as CFO and um, happily can tell you that we've got a strong and stable uh, football and executive department and these have been big changes. And then it was the delivery of objectives. <clears throat> the first objective was to start to start start to win back some uh, uh, silverware. We we got the uh, we got the cup, and then we went forward to win the league, which of course took us to automatic qualification for the first time in a very long time, uh, qualifying for Champions League football. So these were the big moments for me. Chris, if I can come to you next, take us through the annual reported numbers. Revenue was up 27.5 million in the year, Jerry, relative to the prior year. And, and the key reason was COVID. It was all about COVID and our ability to operate the stadium at full capacity again. And it largely boils down to that, along with our shops trading as well, to be fair, throughout the entire year this season. Looking at the, the bottom line earnings, we recorded a profit of 6.1 million, which is a turnaround from a loss of 11.5 million in the prior year and again a big feature of that was the revenue conversion to earnings but gains in sale as well which has been a cornerstone of our business over many years now. We recorded again of sale of 29 million in the year which is a record for us which really served to underpin that earning profile and we finished the year with a net funding position of 30.2 million up from 16.6 .6 million the prior year so a really strong recovery given it was a Europa League year we, I mean, we we're absolutely delighted with where we got to in the end. Michael, reflecting on last season, what were the key priorities for the club? Well, it was important to deliver success for our supporters, Jenny. And uh, as Ian mentioned, we had success on the pitch. Ange led us to a League uh, Cup, a Championship, and back into the group stages of the Champions League. Uh, Fran led the women's team to a, a Cup double, and our B team competed in the Football Pyramid for the first time. Um, so that's all credit to the players and the staff involved in that. And we were delighted for the supporters and for our colleagues and for everybody that played a part in contributing to that success. Off the pitch, it was important that we continue to press forward as well. And the priority for us was to build on that success. Off the pitch, we worked with Ange to review and to improve the football technical functions, whether it's uh, recruitment, medical, sports science, the academy. And these are uh, critical factors for our future success. You mentioned the Champions League. How important was it to qualify for, for Europe's top tier competition? Well, domestic success is vital, but um, I mean, the trophy day here, you could feel the atmosphere, you could feel the release. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have been here for a few. Um, I remember bouncing around Block 405 in 1998, but this was special. Uh, as the players walked out onto the pitch, the Champions League music surrounding, uh, the feeling of release and relief to be back in there. And that, that certainty of revenue allows us to build, it allows us to invest in the summer to work with Ange to take us forward. Chris, give us an indication of the monetary value of Champions League qualification. Well, Jerry, the tournament is arguably the best club competition in the world. It's, it's vitally important for clubs like Celtic. We're delighted to be there. It's a statement of the obvious. It allows us to attract better players develop these players into European Champions League players, which fits our player trading model. In terms of the, the monetary value, it's important to point out that UEFA, since the last time we were in the tournament in season 2017-18, have changed the distribution model, and it's, it's less lucrative for clubs like Celtic, but still vitally important. That's important to point out, and just around how the, the, the structure of the distributions work. But needless to say, that's, that's what we need to be every season, and that's what we strive for.
You mentioned changes. There's more Champions League format changes next year. Does that help the finances? Yeah, well, it's a radical overhaul, Jerry, from season 24 onwards. I mean, the traditional model at the moment is 32 teams, eight groups of four. We're moving to one league now with 36 teams, so that's an increase in four teams. It's what's known as a, a Swiss model, which is common in the, in the world of chess, uh, of all places. And gone are the the concept of a home and away um tie against a given team like Real Madrid. You will now play eight tries, which is more than what we're playing at the moment, and it will be four teams at home and four different teams away. UEFA have yet to finalise the numbers. There's an expectation there will be a material growth in the, the media rights value. They're going to market at the moment, so it's unclear, but there is an expectation that there will be significant growth in there. The key is, going forward, is how is that now distributed to the clubs, because the distribution model will change again, and it's unclear how that's going to sit at the moment. But Celtic are at the forefront of those discussions and negotiations through our roles in the European Club Association. Michael, if I can come back to you, looking ahead then, what are the objectives for this season and beyond? Well, as Chris mentioned, uh, we're able to invest and we've been able to work with Ange to invest in the squad and to, to take the club forward. Uh, we've had a good start to the season. We've competed in the Champions League with a young team. We've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the, one of the biggest clubs in the world. Um, but we know that we always want to get better. So we want to, in the short term, we want to work with Ange again to, to enhance the squad. We want to win the league. And we want to go again in the summer. We want to go again and build a club. And off the pitch, we're continuing to invest in the infrastructure around the stadium, Lennox Town and Barrafield. At the stadium, we've completed a project to upgrade the banners around the stadium. We've opened a new sports bar for season ticket holders. And we're about to open a new disabled viewing platform. As part of that project, we also built new office space for colleagues. And we'll continue to look for opportunities to improve the infrastructure for supporters and colleagues as we move forward. At Lennox Town, over the summer, we upgraded the first team environment, including a new gym facility and a meeting place for the first team squad. Ian, if I can finish on a, a personal note, this will be your 12th and final AGM. Can you sum up your feelings? Well, yes, it will. Um, well, it's been an extraordinary passage of, of my life. Um, Life-changing, probably. Um, over the period of my career, which is now quite long, <clears throat> I've been in a lot of big situations, but I don't think I've been in anything quite like football in Celtic. Um, it demands a lot. Uh, the role of the chair, I think, is, is widely misunderstood. I mean, my job is to stay away and stay out mm -hmm. of the football pages, therefore people uh, don't see a lot or don't see anything of what I do, but what I do, uh, I do, I've done to the very best of my abilities. I've been a team player, uh, I've worked for the club and for the executives. Uh, and although it's very hybrid and it's very different, the fundamentals of, of, of it remain the same. You've got to have ambition, um, but you've got to have realistic ambition. And then you've got to have a plan uh, to, uh, to achieve that ambition. Uh, and you've got to stick to that plan. And uh, I think the, the record shows that uh, that's what the club has done o over the last 12 years. It's had a plan, it's stuck to it, and it's, uh, it's, it's achieved almost all of its objectives as it went along. And I guess the last, last word for me is, is to recognise the supporters. Um, I've personally never encountered anything like their passion uh, for Celtic and for everything we're trying to do. And I, I really wish the club and the supporters the very best going forward. There's a huge value placed on, on fan engagement and always has been. I mean, Celtic will always work through the Supporters Association, the network of supporters clubs, the Irish supporters, the various uh, groups that are met with regularly. Um, but the Fans Forum came out of a, an AGM initiative six, seven years ago, which the board accepted and has enthusiastically entered into. So we try and give information out as best that we possibly can, but also taking feedback from fans as well. And from that feedback, then we look to develop various different plans to see if we can overcome the, like maybe some of the challenges that they present to us. There's now a, a network of subgroups and they're talking about issues like ticketing, uh, like the match day experience, whole range of, of specific subjects where there's work done between meetings and then that is fed back and actions are taken. Hopefully over the next few days we'll see 
the introduction of a new accessible platform at Celtic Park as well. That was something that came about through fan consultation and fan engagement and part of the fan forum as well, along with CDSS. And I think the great uh, value of it, and even greater potential value of it, is it brings all uh, Celtic supporters under the, the one roof. There are no, you know, there, there, there's no hierarchy of Celtic supporters. We're all in the same boat, and and the more points of view and the more uh, interest you can get within the fans forum, then the better the discussion and the better the outcome. We have a page on the website which gives everyone all the details for the fan forum, it also covers the minutes of previous meetings. Obviously you see now at home games and away games, like the support seems to be getting younger and from that perspective we would like to hear more from the younger fans, we would like them to come along and engage and join in in these sessions because obviously their input is very, very important for us in terms of taking the club forward. So we're about to launch the, you know, the biggest ever survey of supporter opinion, both uh, at home and also worldwide. And to get the real opinions across the range of, of Celtic supporters, to get the feedback, to tell us what we should be doing better, to tell us what good ideas would be, and just how the whole experience can be enriched and the whole Celtic family brought together uh, even more effectively. One of the positive outcomes that we've had from Fan Forum is the parking exclusion zone was been implemented and introduced by Glasgow City Council. This is one that we felt wasn't in the best interest of Celtic and our supporters. So we kind of opposed that, we fought against that and we've managed to have that drop now, which I think was a big help for fans, particularly coming to home games. So a vehicle has been created and uh, it's in everyone's interest. It's in the club's interest, it's in the supporters' interest uh, to make maximum use of it. And I hope that an ever increasing number of people will. Tony, what was 2021-2022 like for Celtic FC Foundation? It was better than expected, Paul. It was certainly better than the previous financial year and the fact that the football was significantly better made a big, big difference to us as well. We've got most of our project delivery back now and we speak about fundraising and the efforts that we go to to raise funds, but there's nothing more important than what we do with people. Um, there's lots of initiatives going on in various places. We've got the Lions View Sensory Room opened. We've got the Recovery Cafe running at the stadium on a Monday night. We've got Ability Counts back. We've got Cashback Gateway to Employment back. We've got the Lions Lunch Breaks back. And since the year end, we've managed to bring back the You'll Never Talk Alone project. And the holiday home that I mentioned uh, a year ago um, has been operational for the past few months. We've managed to get a lot of our bigger fundraising initiatives back up and running as well in Glasgow and uh, in London and in New York. We've had the Miles for Meals fundraising event. Walfred's Wish, a regular giving scheme, is going strong. Uh, we've had a big, big donation from the Celtic supporters through the Season Book initiative. And that's all thanks to many parts of the Celtic population, if you like, clearly supporters across the world, our committees in London and in Glasgow and in New York, the club's commercial partners who share our values and a big, big contribution from the football department, from the staff and the directors and the trustees across the foundation and the club. So all of the things that we do are only possible because of those people. What is Celtic FC Foundation doing to help with the cost of living crisis? At the end of last year, the Football for Good Fund was sitting at £1.5 million. At year end, in June 2022, it went to £2.5 million. We've managed to engage with over 100 partners on the ground. Tens of thousands of people have uh, been helped through the Football for Good Fund. And longer term, we're still looking for these more sustainable routes out of poverty. But there's always going to be a place for the Football for Good Fund uh, within Celtic FC Foundation. Most recently, since year end, in fact in the last week or so, we've um, introduced a £400,000 investment um, for people who are facing fuel crisis at the moment. So there's going to be 6,200 households. That's the equivalent of 17,000 people um, will get help paying their domestic fuel, their electricity and their gas. And we're also supplying around another 500 winter warmer packs for people who are really, really struggling. Energy costs this year are twice as expensive as they were a year ago. 
um, and they are set to rise again in April. So this is a problem that's not going to go away. And while £400,000 is a massive investment for Celtic FC Foundation, there's still much more to do. And what are the other immediate priorities going forward? On Sunday, which is the club's anniversary, the 6th of November, as everybody knows, we are going to launch this year's Christmas Appeal. Last year's Christmas Appeal was absolutely phenomenal, thanks to the support that we got from across the world. £380,000 was raised, 1,600 families, 2,500 children, 350 vulnerable pensioners, 31 partner charities, and we help people in various places, including Glasgow, London, Ireland and New York. We've got a series of events lined up for this year's Christmas Appeal. We've got our one and only annual bucket collection on the 12th of November. We've got sleepouts in Glasgow, Donegal and London. We've got the Girls for Good event back here at Celtic Park, as we always have. We've got the Santa Stroll. Um, and beyond that, we're also partnering with the ECA and UEFA Children's Foundation to deliver a, a project here at the stadium for Ukrainian refugees, one for displaced adults uh, looking at mental health and one for younger people aged 8 to 17 to, to help them integrate into Scottish society. We've also got a number of supporter-led initiatives coming up. We've got the Great Wall of China trek in April of 2023. We've got the Road to Seville cycle in May 2023. We're trying to expand our fundraising reach geographically. There's loads to do. There's going to be even more to do in this financial year. And I'm very, very grateful to Celtic supporters and partners and funders all over the world who have supported us in the past and who will support us going forward. Thank you. Fran, if we can start by looking back, how do you reflect on last season for your team? I think it was a fantastic season uh, overall. Uh, we were a little bit uh, disappointed with the, with the league form. Um, basically, we have a very young team, and I think in the, uh, in the league, uh, where you know, regularity and, and consistency is the most important factors, I think we lack a little bit because of the inexperience of some of our young talent that we recruit, but in the cup games, I think we were outstanding and we managed to, to win both Cups. It was an incredible season, but we also want to be, want to be better. Uh, to be fair, I have to, to thank uh, the whole structure of the club uh, from top to bottom, uh, the, their vision and the, their investment in the women's side. And this year, really, we managed to, to assemble a squad that is incredible, really. I'm very, very proud. So although last year was outstanding, we always, we always try to be a little bit better. Given the success of last season, as you touched on, what are your aims and ambitions for the team for the season ahead? Uh, hopefully we want to win every, every single game, but yeah, definitely in the league we want to do better than last year and hopefully, hopefully qualify for Champions League, which is something that we feel uh, Celtic Football Club should always be, especially this year where uh, the investment has been uh, bigger than previous years. And the squad is better. It's a very good squad. Uh, I have nightmares every weekend picking the team because <laughs> at least at least three or four players that deserve to start are on the bench because obviously you only can play 11. But that's a good thing to have because they are really challenging, challenging each other. Um, on top of that, another of our goals, we got two, two players for two of the best national teams in, in the world, like Australia and Canada. And we want, we think more players of the squad can actually represent their countries. And that's, that's another of, of our goals for the season, try to make, try to have more international players. Ange, what's your assessment of the last year? Yeah, I guess a uh, lot of progress more than anything else, particularly, um, you know, if I think uh, where we were even 12 months ago, um, yeah, we sort of team was beginning to show, um, you know, some promise, um, but, you know, we were still sort of going through that building stage and, and trying to you know, create a team environment and a culture that will give us success and um, you know, obviously last year we bore the fruit of that uh, you know, after a, a challenging beginning and I think this year we've progressed you know, even further in terms of um, performances, in terms of you know, our playing squad I think stronger. Um, so yeah, progress and, and you know, hopefully um, you know, continued progress. Did you have a personal highlight? No, not really. I think um, 
you know, for me, it's it's been about the way the club and, and the supporters, everyone has embraced sort of me and, and the vision I had for the football club. I think that's always going to be the most important thing for me. Um, obviously, the success is great, but I kind of share that with everyone. But for me personally, it's just a, again, you know, if we look 12 months ago, there wasn't real evidence there that, um, you know, what was going to develop over the next 12 months was going to happen. So the fact that at that time I still felt supported, um, like I said, by everybody, the supporters, the club itself, um, that was the most important thing for me. What's been your assessment of Celtic as a club and also Scottish football in general? Yeah, look, um, it's, uh, it's come as no surprise to me that, you know, I, I, I think the enormity of the football club, it is a massive football club. Um, you know, it is one of the biggest and most recognisable football clubs on the planet and you feel that when you're part of it, you know, and you, and you represent it. Um, you know, there, there isn't anywhere I go now where, you know, there isn't a connection there with this football club. So, and I guess in terms of the Scottish Premiership, just, you know, it, it's, it's a very demanding league, particularly for a club like ours, because uh, the margin for error and the margin between success and failure is really, really small. Um, you know, we, we, as I said, this time last year, we probably, lost three games and, and we had to be perfect to be champions after that so you know that that means that you know this competition for us is is always going to be um, the priority I think uh, to be champions every year but to do that um, you know we know that we're going to have to be um, at our best all the time. The squad you've got is full of quality and depth with so many players making a valuable contribution. How pleased have you been with the development of the squad since you joined the club? Yeah, really pleased, you know, both with the development and the way, you know, the players have, who have come in have embraced the club and, and, you know, what it's all about. I think there isn't a player we've signed that hasn't made a contribution, which I think, you know, for all football clubs, that's what you look for. Others, you know, some hit the ground running, others have taken a little bit longer, but everyone's made a contribution. We've needed everyone to do that. Um, you know, the last, sort of the last um, window was really important to, we kind of recognised last year they were probably a bit thin squad-wise and um, you know we need to do, to do some work this year just to make the squad a bit stronger and robust and I think we've done that um, but more work to come you know we've had you know, probably you know, two sort of windows at the moment where we've had the opportunity to build this squad um, properly um, you know um, with a couple more I think we'll be in, a, in good shape. This year has also seen the appointments of Michael Nicholson as Chief Executive and Chris Mackay as the Chief Financial Officer. How do you work together on a day-to-day -day basis to achieve the club's ambitions? Yeah, you know, really effectively, I guess, is, is the most important thing. Um, you know, aside from the fact that, you know, I get along really well with both those guys and, and they've been really supportive even before sort of they got the extra responsibility in the roles they currently are from, you know, the moment I arrived. Um, you know, they both had key roles anyway within the football club, so you know, we get along really well. I think they understand me and, and sort of my vision, but more importantly, I think we work effectively. You know, I think you've seen that particularly through the transfer windows in that, you know, particularly the last two, um, you know, we've done things very efficiently and, and, you know, without it sort of dragging on too long, I think that's been important. Um, and, and that doesn't happen and there's a real alignment between, you know, um, key stakeholders within the football club. And as I said, for me, um, they're very supportive of me. Um, and as I said, the, the working relationship is really strong. Winning the league title meant automatic Champions League qualification this season. How do you reflect on this year's competition? Yeah, challenging as expected. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, it's our first time sort of in five years and um, you realise before you enter into it that you know, it's, it's a different level to what you know, a lot of our boys have faced before. And, um, <clears throat> It was always going to be a massive challenge for us. So, you know, I, I was really intent on, on sort of tackling it a certain way. Um, probably not the easiest way, to be fair, particularly for our players. Um, but, you know, I thought if we we're going to get maximum value out of our experience this year, irrespective of sort of how it unfolded, we had to, we had to be really strong in our conviction to play our football and be the kind of team we want to be. And I think we've done that. You know, I think we've done that in every game. Uh, we've obviously fallen short and... and we know there are areas we need to improve. I, I don't think that's a surprise to me or to anyone really, because as I said, um, you know, for a lot of our players, it's not like they've come off the back of, you know, three or four years of European campaigns, 
whether that's Europa League or or Champions League, um, for a lot of them, this was the first sort of dip in their toe into, you know, the highest level of club football. And uh, I think, you know, they've adapted as well as they could, they could and I think they'll be better for it. So um, I think we've maximised our experience. We're disappointed at the outcome, but certainly motivated to, to make an impact next time in. Off the park, you've made a number of other developments to the football department in areas such as sports science, recruitment, analysis and medical. How happy are you with the structure you now have? Yeah, really pleased. Um, again, it uh, wasn't just on field that we needed to sort of, um, you know, um, make sure we were running things, you know, to, to the best possible, highest possible standards. And um, yeah, we've made some really key additions over the last uh, 18 months um, in all those areas, plus coaching and all the guys who've come in have really added to what we already had. We had some you know, great people here, um, but they needed you know, resources, they needed help. And um, again, that's where the club and, and Michael and, and Chris have been really supportive in, in sort of making sure that whatever I needed, we got in the building. And uh, yeah, we're, I think we're, we're, we're working at really good levels at the moment, but constantly looking to improve, um, you know, and that's the key for us, whether that's within those departments or other areas that of growth, um, you know, we're not going to stand still. We want to make sure, you know, best practice models. And, and as I said, Champions League exposure gives us an opportunity to really measure ourselves as well in every area. And, um, you know, if we want to be a Champions League football club, um, that means that we need to be that on and off the pitch. And uh, that's why you know, we'll constantly be seeking to, you know, to, to make sure that we're making the adjustments we need. There have also been changes to the B team structure with Darno D, and Stephen Mann is taking over. Do they link directly to you? And what was your thinking behind changing the structure? Yeah, I thought it was important. Obviously, you know, last year, you know, with me coming in and, and you know, our B team playing in, in the Lowland League and, and, and it was cool, everything was kind of new. I didn't want to disrupt things too much. You know, my focus was really on the first team in that first 12 months and, and making sure that you know, I had a hell of a lot of work to do in that area, um, but always kept an eye on sort of the B team structure and how I thought it should be aligned. I guess it's a, a you know, a, a unique sort of position we're in where, you know, our, our B team are playing in a, in a, in a really good competition um, this year in Europe as well. So I thought it made sense to try and align, you know, the, the, the two entities as much as possible. Um, you still want individual player development to be the focus at, at, at B team level, but, you know, I had Steve, McManus working with me last year and he knows exactly what we were doing at first team level and I thought it made sense to to, to put him with, with our younger guys and, and, and Darren was somebody who again had spent a lot of time with us and I thought you know they're two young guys who are really ambitious about being the best kind of coaches they can be and with their strong Celtic sort of pedigree I think that helps as well because they've, they've sort of um, charted that path that you need to from a young player to get to the first team so my sort of direct involvement with the B team is through those two guys, you know, the rest of it, you know, there's a lot of people like Chris McCard and others who, who are running the, 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 the B team and, and um, you know, the academies, but, you know, with Darren and, and Steve, you know, they're sort of reporting directly to me and I'm giving them the guidance and, and the feedback so that, you know, they know that, and I know that the boys who are training there are, are, are getting all the sort of right work done so that when they make that step up, it's an easy transition. Going back to the first team, what are your main priorities for the squad going forward? To keep improving, that's that's it, you know, progress never stands still. Uh, you know, whatever we've done so far has, has, has been fantastic, um, but, you know, as I said, my ambition is to, you know, make us a Champions League club. That doesn't happen, you know, uh, quickly or, or with quick fixes, it takes a time and, um, you know, with the squad, I'm, I'm, we, when you look at our sort of age demographic, we're still young and I want to keep it that way. But hopefully as our players progress and, and, and keep improving this squad, every time you know somebody sort of leaves this squad, we, we try and improve the squad by bringing a better version of the ones that have gone and, and, and working with them. And, and I think, you know, bridging that gap between us and sort of the elite clubs in, in Europe is, is a process that we need to try and chip away at. We're not going to make major inroads, but every year we should be looking to get a step closer. The style of football you play is one that fans enjoy. Attacking, committed, entertaining. It's the traditional Celtic way. How fundamental is that to your approach? And it's successful, which um, none of that other stuff would count. Um, so, 
you know, I'm, I'm well aware of, you know, you know, what the fans of this football club sort of want to see in their, in their team. And you're right, you know, it is about you know, being exciting, scoring goals, getting the, 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 our, our supporters off their seats, but we're never compromising the fact that we have to be successful. So, um, you know, that, that's always been the driver for me. It's about bringing success wherever I've been, but also in a way where, you know, the supporters, um, you know, really enjoy that when they come and watch their team play. And I think at the moment we're, we're striking that balance really well, um, particularly obviously in, here in Scotland, but now it's about, you know, like I said, the next frontier and that's Europe. Can we, you know, play, be the football team we want to be and, and be successful in, in, in Europe? So, um, but yeah, I think it's important and, and certainly, you know, that's um, the road I want us to continue down on. And finally, Ange, you're probably the most selfie person in Scotland. It's noticeable at away games, the number of men, women and children, even from the opposition fans who want a picture with you. You're obviously always happy to oblige, but is it something you'll ever get used to? No, look, I, I you know, I, I, I don't because I, I kind of, you know, it's still a little bit, you feel a little bit surreal that the people, but I also know the impact it has. And I think it's important. Um, you know, uh, sometimes it's just, you know, people who are pretty happy and, and just want to, you know, take a selfie. But, you know, for other people, it, it's a special moment for them and, and I never lose sight of that, you know. They, they're taking a selfie, not with me, they're taking a selfie with a Celtic manager. That's who they're taking a selfie with and that's that sort of responsibility is never lost on me. So I'm happy to oblige and, uh, you know, I've had a few that um, have been photobombed by others and, uh, and, and I've had to help a few take them because, um, the old selfie is not an easy one to do, but uh, I'll become an adept at it and, uh, as I said, happy to help out.